My name is Maureen Fitzgerald, and I am a recovering lawyer. <laughs> About 10 years ago, I went to an event almost exactly like this one. I remember the auditorium and seeing a sea of black and gray suits and crisp white blouses. It was 200 women lawyers, and I felt like I had arrived, that this was my tribe. I didn't know that that event would change the course of my life. But before I go on, I have to come clean. Although my talk today is about removing the barriers that hold women back, I was not always interested in gender inequality. In fact, I was one of those lawyers who had her nose firmly to the grindstone. I worked absurd hours. And I didn't care that I wasn't invited to the golf games or client lunches. I did what I had to do to succeed. But on that night, my eyes were opened. I remember settling into my seat and looking up at the stage, and I saw this young guy in jeans and a t-shirt. And I thought, oh, technical problems. <laughs> but then he began to approach the podium. And this was his first slide, the seven fatal mistakes that women make. And this young man, for the next 45 minutes, told all of these women and me in the room precisely what we were doing wrong. We were wearing the wrong clothes. We were saying the wrong things. We weren't assertive enough. We weren't aggressive enough. And worst of all is that we were doing a disservice to our clients. I remember going home that night in a bit of a fog, and it wasn't until the next morning when I woke up and I had this, aha, what if women aren't the problem? <laughs> what if the way we think about women is the problem? So I spent the next eight years researching the topic. I pursued a doctorate degree and wrote three books on the topic. And I have to tell you, I am completely delighted to be here tonight to tell you what I know. So let me start by stating the obvious. Although women have been graduating in equal numbers for about 20 years from universities and colleges across North America, they remain grossly underrepresented at the top. Today, women represent about 5% of the CEOs of the big corporations, about 20% of our elected representatives, and about 25% of the highest level academic positions. In fact, of the top 1,500 organizations in the United States, there are more CEOs with the name John than there are women. <laughs> but there's also some really good news, and the good news is this. There's a huge amount of growing research on the benefits of women. We know that including women and full participation of women today can accelerate the global economy, can increase corporate profits, and can even improve all of our standard of living. A small known fact is that during the Icelandic financial meltdown, there's only one financial firm that survived, and that was a firm of four women. Another small known fact is that when micro lenders lend money to women, they not only end up with more money themselves, and the women end up with more money, but so too do families and communities. Study after study has said repeatedly that including women is not just the right thing to do, it's the economic thing to do. So if we know that women are so amazing, why is there still such a huge gender gap? So some of you might recall the uh, well-overwatched TED Talk by Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook. Sheryl Sandberg not only did a TED Talk, but she also followed it up by a best-selling book called Lean In. And in that book, she did an amazing job of describing all of the barriers, or many of the barriers that held women back, for everything from subtle discrimination to sexual harassment. But Cheryl did something very interesting. 
instead of focusing on those barriers, she decided to focus on women. And so her message, initially at least, was raise your hands more, sit at the table, be more courageous. And although these are probably very good pieces of advice for individual women, there's a couple of problems with this focus on women. The first is that it places the full burden of the change on women. We expect women to attend courses, read more books, and work even harder to bridge the gender gap. The second is that those women who act just a bit too assertive end up suffering a backlash, these subtle penalties for, asking, acting, acting, for acting in a way that's just a bit too masculine. And the third problem is a crisis of confidence that I actually personally suffered after 10 years of law practice. It should come as no surprise after wearing black, stiff gray suits, gray, gray and black suits, wearing ugly black shoes, and even blow drying my hair straight for 10 years, that I, I didn't know who I was. And it's no surprise that I suffered from the so-called imposter syndrome. But the biggest problem of all of urging women to lean in and focusing exclusively in on women is this. Every single one of you who's not a woman climbing the corporate ladder gets off the hook. And not only that, but we can comfortably ignore all of the research that points to very specific barriers that continue to hold women back. So let me tell you a story. A little while ago, a father and his son were in a car accident. And the father walked away, but the son was badly injured. So he called an ambulance, drove the son to the hospital, and the son was being wheeled into the surgery when the surgeon came in and looked at the boy and said, I can't operate on that boy. He's my son. So the question for you is, who is the surgeon? Now I see a few of you scratching your heads, and I want to tell you this. The surgeon's a mother. But the reason we don't often see the surgeon as the mother, and it kind of messes us up, is because of this thing in our heads called implicit bias. We don't see women as surgeons. And implicit bias is the main cause of the gender gap today. What's implicit bias? Some of you already know it's basically unconscious ideas in your head that are going around and around, and some of them are really good and some of them not so good. But for women, there are three particular types of implicit bias that are deeply troublesome. The first is male preference. Now, you may not know this, but the research is quite clear. Both men and women prefer males. Not only do we prefer males, but we actually prefer masculine characteristics. There's a very well-known research study called the Heidi and Howard study, and this is fantastic. It's just simply a professor deciding one day to hand out one resume to their, her whole group of students, unbeknownst to the students. She decided to put Heidi at the top of one and Howard at the top of the other resume. And then she asked them to give her feedback, and what she discovered is this. Although all the students agreed that Heidi Heidi and Howard had the same credentials and confidence level, they rarely selected Heidi. And what the students said is this. They didn't like Heidi, and they didn't trust Heidi. The second type of bias that is particularly troublesome for women is called in-group favoritism. Now, we all know this because it just simply means we like to be around people who look and act like us. There's only one problem, and that is if all of the corporations, all of the elected officials, and all of the top-level academic positions are occupied by men, they tend to only invite in those men and women who look and act like them. The third barrier is what the researchers call the maternal wall, and it's a whole bundle of barriers, but it's particularly bad for women. It's simply this idea that somehow women in childbearing ages are incompetent. They're too sensitive, they're too emotional, they're too 
caring, they're too, a lot of things. We just assume this about women. But worse is that they're not committed to their jobs. The minute you have a child, you're less committed to your job, which ironically is the opposite that we feel for men, because as soon as men have children, we all assume that he's going to be more committed to his job. But what I found interesting about this is these particular three groups of biases have one common root. And what surprised me when I looked at them all and stepped back is something very interesting that I had discovered or heard about for the first time 30 years ago. I was in an economics class in first year of university. Why I signed up for economics, I don't know. <laughs> and a substitute professor came in and she said, oh dear, economics, I don't know anything about economics, but I want to tell you about my most amazing pink and blue diaper research. So she said, what we did is we brought in these 20 babies, boy and girl babies, but we dressed them at random in pink and blue diapers. And then we invited parents in to hold the babies. And then we videotaped the whole thing. And she said, the most amazing thing happened. The parents held the pink diaper babies very close to their bodies and spoke to them in very soft tones like, isn't she so sweet? And the blue diaper babies, the, ba the parents held the babies away from their bodies and spoke to them in somewhat louder tones like, oh, you're a tough guy. <laughs> so what's interesting to me is this is just five minutes of parental implicit bias. So imagine a lifetime. And then my friends say to me, yeah, yeah, the pink or do di the diapers, whatever, Maureen, Maureen, pink and blue diapers, what on earth does that have to do with the gender gap? And this is what I tell them. In our society, we take a pink box and we label it as feminine. And then we squeeze in all of our girls and women, squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze them in, and tell them they have to be certain things like nice and kind and sweet and all of these things and many more. And then we take a blue box and we label it as masculine. And we squeeze all our men and boys into this box and we tell them they have to be tough and aggressive and, and unemotional and, and many, many more things. And that's not very good. But here's the interesting thing. In our society, we take this blue box and we elevate it. We raise it up and we say, this blue box Males and masculine traits and masculine roles are more important to our society. And then we take this pink box and we lower it down. And we say females and female roles and feminine characteristics are less valuable to our society. And that is what I call pink and blue bias. And that is the taproot of all gender inequality in the world. And before I get to solutions, because that's the fun part of the talk, I want to ask you this one question. Who invented these boxes? So there's a number of solutions. I'm just going to tell you about two of them. The most obvious is socialization. The first thing we have to do is get rid of the pink and blue boxes. We have to raise our children outside the box. We have to raise them in a way where they're truly equals. Then we have to define masculine and feminine much differently. And then we have to get rid of the stereotypes that we carry around every single day. But this is really hard work. And it's because implicit bias is not just invisible, it's deeply imprinted in us, almost like DNA. So it would take a very long time to change those biases. As well, we are all swimming in a culture filled with media messages and TVs and, and magazines that reinforce this pink and blue bias all the time. But the good news is there's this emerging body of science, and it's called Designing for Equality. And I just want to share a few ideas with you around this. The best example of Designing for Equality is the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And what the Boston Symphony Orchestra realized one day is they can't, couldn't attract women. They didn't know why, what it was they were doing wrong. So one day they decided to put a huge curtain 
between the musicians who were being interviewed for the orchestra and the selection panel. And before long, they had hired a huge number of women. The other one I love to talk about is with just simply blind resumes, which means you take a resume and you just black out the name of the person on the top so they couldn't be discriminated against. But I have three more I want to share with you really quickly, and that is quotas. It just simply means holding a seat at the table for women, leaving a place open so that they can join. The second is actually my secret. I think this is the solution to gender inequality, if, you, if I were going to put my money there. It's flexible work. It just simply means working anywhere, anytime. But the great thing for women is women are the ones who typically do the housework and raise the children. So when they leave the workplace and come back in, they suffer severe penalties. So flexible work would solve that problem very quickly. And another one is transparent pay, which I think by just disclosing what you earn, we could end the gender pay gap tomorrow. Not only that, but it would really help us understand why we pay certain jobs more than others. So I often think back of that fateful night when that young man walked across the stage and told me and 200 other women that we were doing everything wrong. In fact, I'm standing here today because of him. Because I don't want my daughters, I don't want your daughters, I don't want any woman in the world to feel like she's not quite good enough. So what can you do today? Number one, we must stop asking women to lean in. We must instead focus on the very real barriers identified in the research. Number two, we must all admit that we are biased and challenge those biases every single day. And third, men and women, if you really want an equal society, not just gender equality. If you really want that, you have to come together. We have to come together. Step outside of our boxes. Put down our differences, because we are all casualties of our limited thinking. And the next time you get the delight and honor and privilege to hold a baby in your arms, whether it's a boy or a girl, you just simply have to say, you are amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much.